Hi, welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. And today I am joined by the fantastic Sarah Hawley to talk about her fantastic debut, which I devoured in less than two days. Like, oh, I just couldn't put it down. So good. Um, so we have to tell everyone out there about it. So, um, so the cosy spice romance era, this, uh, is, yeah. this, <laughs> this is the place to be. Um, so what can you tell anyone out there without too many spoilers about your debut book? All right. Well, great. First of all, thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Uh, so my book, A Witch's Guide to Fake Dating a Demon, um, this is the beautiful UK cover, is about a, uh, it, well, first of all, it's contemporary paranormal romance uh, set in Washington State in the United States uh, in a world where magic is in the open and always has been. It's about a witch named Mariel Spark, who is prophesied to be amazing at magic, but and she ends up usually blowing things up or summoning inappropriate objects. Uh, she has a very overbearing mother who just wants her to live up to the family legacy. And as she is practicing her spellcraft one day trying to do this, she tries to summon flour to uh, bake some muffins and ends up summoning a demon instead. And the demon is summoned for an unbreakable soul bargain. He cannot leave her side until she signs over her soul to him. Uh, and that is a mixture of her magic and her emotions. She obviously does not want to do this. So they end up sort of being roommates uh, as, oh my God, my cat just tried to <laughs> sabotage everything. Uh, <laughs> there was nearly a full pint of water spilled all over oh the my, there. Oh my God. How many cats do you have? <laughs> I have two cats. Uh, okay. I have two cats named um, Coco and Starbuck. Starbuck after the Battlestar Galactica reboot. No. But, uh, and then Coco just... He's cute. Um, anyway, so she tries to summon this, uh, or she summons this demon. They end up being awkward roommates. Her mother stops by and is like, who is this man in your kitchen? She doesn't want to confess that she has failed at Spellcraft once again, so she says that it's her boyfriend. He's also struggling a little bit with some new emotions due to a, a bargain went wrong. He ended up with a human soul himself, so he's feeling things he hasn't felt before. And uh, as sort of the, the clock is winding down for him to make this bargain for her soul, they sort of have to navigate uh, falling in love and also the fact that if they do fall in love, if she gives her soul over, she she wouldn't be able to love him anymore. So that's the premise. We've got another, the, the cat is determined, <laughs> determined to be part of this interview. So maybe you'll be lucky. Um, but yes. <laughs> oh my God. Maybe are any of the characters, um, I was just going to think like, you could feature the cats. Are any of the characters like based on your <laughs> No, what's weird is I do have this side character that I think recurs in all three books who um, he's a magical juggler and he's constantly in the background juggling like bowling balls or um, orbs of magic and cats. And so that, th those are my cats in the book is this man who is juggling them. Um, they are in the, the background. Okay. You, you couldn't leave them out. It's you couldn't leave them out. <laughs> Understandable. Understandable. <laughs> Um, and there's a, obviously a huge uh, baking and kind of food element to the book. So what is your preferred writing snack? Ooh. Um, oh, gosh. I mean, I, I I sort of write all over the place. I would have to say a bagel in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. I really like going to a local coffee shop that has bagels. And just it's a nice way to start the day um, by eating that and having some coffee. So that would be it. <laughs> Oh, always good. We were saying, obviously, before the interview started, that caffeine is always the always yes. the answer. So, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> and what came uh, kind of first for you in the book? Was it kind of the characters? Did they come to you fully formed, or was it kind of the the world kind of building that that came first? I would say it was the characters. Um, I I don't really know how I came up with the idea. I just remember thinking like, I want to write, um, cause I, my background is I wrote mostly fantasy and was trying to get published in the fantasy space, um, but read a ton of romance. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want to write a fantasy romance. And uh, I just really like magic systems. I like witches. So I think I started there and just came up with the idea of a witch who summons a demon um, for a soul bargain. Mm -hmm. And then the, that sort of fundamental premise then came to, why does he need her soul? Um, what what does how do they fall in love while trying to navigate this so I, I would say it came from the characters and then the world built out from there and it was I did want to do a world where magic is up front and um, you can sort of explore what it would be like to live in this magical town where it's not like it's hidden underground we're not having to keep it secret uh, I thought that made it a lot more fun in terms of world building mm -hmm. 
And I think you've mentioned before about the world. So it's a world where both dragons and Taylor Swift exist in, in yes. perfect harmony. So. <laughs> yes. Yes, the, the hero of book two is another demon um, and he is a Swifty. Uh, so Okay, okay. We've got that to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the humour element in particular, so obviously quite... Um, early on I was guffawing to myself um and especially about the uh, a certain uh, summoning of a certain uh, accidental dildo um yes. so where, where did the idea come, come for the for the mishaps of our main character it was just so fun um you start thinking about all the different ways she could embarrass herself all the different ways her magic could backfire obviously you want the sexual tension to be there from the beginning so that you can believe them falling in love so sort of it, it was a way to wink at she is thinking about him in a little bit of a carnal manner in the beginning um because your magic is a mixture of of the spellcraft and your intent and your technique so the intent is a part of it so the fact that while speaking with him she accidentally summons this dildo felt like a little bit of a wink that perhaps there is a there's more to their dynamic <laughs> yes yeah and i bet the uh some of those uh spicy scenes were quite fun to fun to write as well <laughs> they're fun to write but they are mortifying to read in past pages which is where <laughs> they have you read everything line by line word by word it's the very last chance to catch any typos so you really have to go through mm. and reading it and being like oh my god i wrote this and then you remember your family's reading it you remember that everyone you've ever well not everyone you've ever known but <laughs> Your friends, people who know you, um, <laughs> will read this and be like, "Oh my God, Sarah has this incredibly, um, very um, vivid imagination, or or something." <laughs> so that that was pretty mortifying, but they're fun to write. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I think I was at a um, uh, signing a couple of months back where they were doing a panel about kind of women in fantasy and talking about how writing a sex scene is apparently very similar to writing a battle scene. Which is quite in which is quite an interesting uh idea. So yeah, if you ever want to go into some bloodthirsty battle fantasy next, you've all, you're already halfway there. So <laughs> well uh the next book, the sex scenes are a lot more combative in a in a oh. fun way. So okay. um, yes. Yeah, we've got real enemies to lovers with some people who like grappling. So ah, yeah. is there wrestlers? Is there that uh, like, no, Lucha it's Dom? A <laughs> That'd be cool. No, it's um a, a demon who's very good with a with a sword. Um, oh. and the, the heroine of book two is one of the best friends from book one, and she's sort of a, a bodybuilder, fitness freak, kickboxer. Very so. cool. Okay, okay, sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there is a oh, sorry, that's the <laughs> Do you, if you ever want me to stop um <laughs> recording. Oh back. my god. Um, we can we can we can cut the. <laughs> <laughs> cut the cat chaos out <laughs> hopefully <laughs> they're in a mood right now this is apparently the wild time i'm not normally home at this hour so i'm not used to experiencing this <laughs> <laughs> but we'll we'll start with the next question and yeah if we need to kind of <laughs> okay um so looking at kind of the the themes and like some of the tropes that are used like the enemies to lovers um what do you seek out like what are your favorite tropes to read when you're reading kind of romance or romanticy is obviously the the new the new term <laughs> uh, enemies to lovers 100 yes. that is my favorite always has been um all my favorite ships tend to be enemies to lovers there's just something about that um the energy of it and, and i was trying to articulate this the other day that it's not just the tension of the like this hate that can boil over into passion. I think it's also because true enemies to lovers is sort of based on mutual respect, uh, mm -hmm. where they respect someone as a foe. And, and the fact that it's sort of a it's it's a very equal sort of dynamic in a way where it's like I it's it's not that one person is is subordinate to the other or, you know, in a, a place of lesser power. It's that both of them have their own power and respect that power in each other. And I think that makes for a really good um, basis for a relationship in fiction. I mean, also <laughs> in, in life, but hopefully we don't have that many enemies in life. <laughs> well, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um one of the things i particularly adored was kind of the the friendship group and obviously her kind of two 
best mates and it's just wonderful to read and kind of their their obviously their dialogue and conversations so are they kind of based off real people you know no they are not um <laughs> very real <laughs> oh, oh good. good no I just um I don't know how they they just kind of popped into my head that way uh and it, people people ask me before like Mariel is very much um she really likes baking she really likes gardening uh, she likes cooking and they're like do you like those things I'm like no no I, I killed a cactus once because I forgot I owned it um <laughs> I just didn't water it for a year I don't know um no <laughs> so it's like the, Mariel's not based in my life in any way I know almost nothing about plants uh the best friends are not based on anything but they just sort of popped into my head like they were like they were real people it was interesting oh wow it, I mean, they do read very real. So, I mean, that's obviously, that's a great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great thing. Um, so let's touch on, um, I was having fun with the idea of writing a dating profile for their kind of, it's Bumbelina, isn't it? The, yes, it's Bumbelina. Yeah. So if you had to write your dating profile for Bumbelina, like, what would be your tagline? Oh my gosh, what a horrible question. Um, we can come back to it if you need to. <laughs> why am I thinking? Um, it's, it's, they must love cats and whimsy. Um, likes going on adventures. Um, general oddity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I am single right now. If any a very handsome demon or or someone wants to sweep me off my feet. But uh, yeah, I guess I would look for someone that you can you can sort of romp around the woods with and uh, go to a museum and look at artifacts. Uh, I actually come from a, a background in archaeology. So that's something I really love. Uh, and then just just being strange in a in a nice, lighthearted way way i think is um being able to embrace that sort of inner silliness is something that's very important to me not taking yourself too seriously so that that's a terrible dating profile but somewhere in there i would i would work out the word <laughs> and find my perfect dragon shifter match or whatever's going on <laughs> they're out there somewhere so. out there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so we we were just talking before off camera about uh various fandoms and we have a uh, star wars celebration coming up in the uk this weekend which is very exciting um and you're a fan you, you throw your hat in the ring to do some star wars i would love to write some star wars <laughs> um i've written a lot of star wars fan fiction actually uh it was sort of um I, I, I don't know. I came to fan fiction really late. I discovered it, I think, in 2019. I hadn't read any before, and I, I read something um, and was just absolutely smitten by how fun it was to play with these worlds. So I started writing my own, um, and then my editor at Berkeley actually uh, was a fan of my fan fiction. So she she found me through that, even though I had been like um, on sub in traditional ways. I hadn't gone on sub with this project at all, but she sort of liked the tone of some of my Star Wars fan fiction. So found me that way. Um, I would absolutely love that. So Star Wars is a big fandom of mine. Um, Star Trek was sort of my original fandom. Uh, I watched a lot of that growing up with my uh, my family. Uh, the new Battlestar Galactic reboot, I really like that. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm a big, huge lover of the fantasy and sci-fi space. That I mean that that's always like obviously the best place to be like yeah. especially I think a lot of people we joke about it at work that we were geeks before it was cool. So, <laughs> but now like just everyone's kind of embracing that in a geek yeah. it's just great <laughs> it's great it's great um and the heroine of the book three in this trilogy is a trekkie so Ooh, uh, okay yeah she's also like a 700 year old vampire succubus assassin but she's a trekkie as well which is important. God, okay yeah Co <laughs> cosplay cosplay incoming for <laughs> does she have yes. a name yet or she does uh, uh we'll see if it, it stays um it's actually Muriel's name changed because uh, I didn't realize that there was an actually a Scottish author named Muriel Spark. I had just made up this name. I thought it sounded witchy. Uh, and so okay. we changed Muriel to be a little different. But right now, heroine of book three is, is tentatively named Eleonora Betancourt Devereux. She's a, mm -hmm. yes, half okay. vampire, half succubus. Yeah. Very murderous. So. But, oh, it's too good. Too good. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
have you ever kind of with older ideas do you ever kind of go back to kind of old any older book ideas and think oh maybe I could rework and yeah I mean it's it'll be interesting to see I do have some old projects that didn't get sold that I'm hoping could be at some point um but you never know it really depends on the market it depends on like now that i'm i'm doing these very um sort of funny spicy rom-coms um this is my first time really writing humor in my professional work i was doing a lot of humor in the fan fiction space so um, my old ideas aren't so humorous so i don't know if i'll revisit them but i have i have so many ideas uh i have i have so many things kicking around in my head so it just depends who wants me <laughs> to let me work on what <laughs> when <laughs> And what was your kind of first um, foray into, you said about writing kind of uh, fan fiction. Um, what was your first kind of foray into reading uh, fantasy and sci-fi and all the good stuff? Uh, reading sci-fi fantasy was my mother's influence. She had a big collection and uh, my my father was more into nonfiction and military history and that. So uh, in elementary school, I was reading, I remember doing book reports on the Chronicles of Amber by Roger Zelazny. And you had to, uh, you had to write down like what happened in the book you read this week. And people are doing like the babysitter's club. And I'm like, 10,000 orcs died in like the, <laughs> so I was reading that. Um, I was reading that. I was reading um, Ursula Le Guin. I was reading uh, Ray Bradbury and Douglas Adams uh, and Andre Norton and just and of course Tolkien so my entire the vast majority of what I read in elementary school and after was sci-fi fantasy uh and then um uh the the Song of the Lioness series and Wild Magic by Tamar Pierce was also very formative so all sorts of stuff I don't even remember the first fantasy or sci-fi book I read but it was it was probably first grade or something yeah oh wow fantastic uh just too too many good things and even Mm-hmm. like the Tamora Pierce and stuff I think they stand up to the test of time they just read as well today mm-hmm. which is just yeah I need to re- revisit that because that was definitely um and I think probably that sparked my interest in romance even though I started reading actual romance when I was an adult um just because it was sort of having the romantic subplot in a fantasy novel I was like yes I would like this I would like more of this please <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah no Definitely. I'm I'm glad that this is kind of having a moment as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many books coming out this year, next Mm -hmm. year. We had obviously some great things last year that are, it's okay to have some romance in your fantasy. In fact, Mm -hmm. I insist (laughs) you do it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, So coming, coming back to obviously such a fantastic book, it actually um, in parts kind of touches on some really kind of, important issues obviously there's the environmental issues that are touched upon and uh obviously the um <laughs> the neon pink sign that they get a certain demon to hold up yeah. um <laughs> as well as kind of the i suppose the family pressures of you know being almost like the you know the chosen one of the family mm-hmm. having to kind of in- inherit that name um and not feeling like you kind of live up to that so were these kind of obviously important issues to cover and how did you go about uh putting putting them into the into the book yeah i would say in terms of the environmental message uh obviously i'm i'm very concerned about climate change as i think most of us are it's really distressing to see and so having a witch whose powers are in nature allowed me to have someone who's emotionally connected to the forest and the forest is emotionally connected to her in terms of putting it into the book, because this is a lighthearted comedy rom-com, I, I had to make everything okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of one of the big the big subplots is that this resort uh, and spa going in might rip up the forest and, and destroy the ley lines, which is uh, where the magic in the soil comes from and why this very magical town is there. So uh, having that plot, it's it was very important to then resolve it. The forest is okay. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler to say <laughs> this is a lighthearted <laughs> book. Um, In terms of familial pressures, my parents and I actually joke about this a lot because they're lovely. They're lovely people. And they joke that all of my books, the parents are just horrible or they're dead. They're like, what did we do to you? But (laughs) happy families don't make necessarily interesting fiction. (laughs) So they, I, to me, the pressure of not living up to a legacy, I don't have a direct one-to-one in my life in terms of family pressure, but I do think a lot of us have felt the pressure to have a life and hit milestones that isn't as feasible anymore. So 
you know, by such and such an age, you'll be married and you'll have a house and there's sort of these steps and you'll, you'll feel like your life is progressively like you're hitting your mark. And most people I know aren't hitting those marks at all. And in fact, it's, it's almost impossible to hit a lot of those marks. The housing is so expensive. Um, there's, it's just a different world. It's a different world. And sort of all the, the myths you were told and the myths you told yourself about what success would look like kind of are sometimes not proven not to be true. And it's important for me, I think, to have this heroine who realizes she doesn't have to be exactly what this prophecy said she would be. In fact, maybe she can't be exactly what this prophecy said she would be. Or maybe people are applying this prophecy to her incorrectly because they don't appreciate what she is and what she has. Uh, and the, the idea that there's merit in who people are, at, no matter if they're fulfilling some arbitrary bar of success. So I, I would say it was important for me to to put that in there. Um just as as a way of like finding self-worth and empowerment in in who you are and where you're at at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, they're obviously both very important messages and they're kind of dealt with such kind of heart. And obviously it yeah, it just comes across as yeah, just such a such a wonderful book. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you for writing. <laughs> Thanks. I, I get even more political in, in the next book. So it's I'm okay. definitely doing some some catharsis here. <laughs> So three free therapy basically for anyone writing or reading it's yeah perfect <laughs> um so we're drawing to a close now for the uh, FPTV slot today um so a couple more questions so what are you currently reading watching and if you game what are you playing um i don't game uh I, I, we just didn't have that growing up. And so every time I've tried, I'm just very bad at it. And it's embarrassing. Yes. <laughs> uh, right now I'm reading a, a couple of arcs. Uh, I'm reading uh, Do Your Worst by Rosie Dannon. Uh, and then I've got, um, I'm really lucky. I've got The the Hurricane Wars by Thea Guanzan. And I've got an early copy of that. And that's coming out <laughs> in the fall. So I'm reading those right now. In terms of watching, right now I've been watching um, the, the, uh, great british pottery throwdown um oh, okay. yes it's, yeah. it's very soothing it's very nice to see uh, i'd love to take up pottery sometime i did a little bit of it during high school and that's sort of someday like that is the hobby i want to have is to be a potter so it's it's just been very soothing to watch uh, i did finish uh the last of us was something i just watched that was really good mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I would say that's those are the things on on the docket right now Yes, yeah, because that's also <laughs> the Last of Us has coined a new phrase. So obviously there's romanticy, and now there's spora, which is spore-based horror. <laughs> so um, yeah, <laughs> um, I guess spore-based horror. Um, Mexican Gothic is a book with some yes. spore-based horror. Oh, that was yes. pretty good. Mm. Yes, yeah. There's some yeah. There's some 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 creepy stuff out there with mm -hmm. spores. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Ugh. <laughs> so what can you uh, tell us? I know you, obviously you've hinted a little bit about what's to come next, but what can you tell us about um, book two? And does your book three have a title yet? So book two is A Demon's Guide to Wooing a Witch. It picks up immediately after Witch's Guide to Fake Dating a Demon. Um, this The synopsis is already out there, so I, I don't think it's spoilers to say that um, the villain of book one is the hero of book two, because I love an, I love an enemies to lovers. Um, it is an amnesia road trip romance. Uh, there's werewolf brawls. There's... Um, rubber duck onesies um and then there's a there's a big plot about the politics and the demon plane so we'll spend a little bit more time there with them and the high council and uh some policies that are um anti anti-immigration uh that that that's no good um yes i i get very political the the demon high yeah. council i was i was drafting it during um basically the repeal of abortion rights in America. And so the Demon High Council suddenly became nine members that resemble the Supreme Court a lot. And then we're dealing with issues of like your know, bodily autonomy and uh, what counts as a real demon and should we open the borders to immigration, things like that. So it's uh, my agenda is not not particularly hidden in this one. Um, book three, I've got a couple titles. I'm not great at titling things. I, I did not come up with A Witch's Guide to Fake Dating a Demon. 
I did come up with a demon's guide to wooing a witch. Um, so I, I don't think I can tell the title of book three yet just because it's not finalized. But that one is going to involve Mariel's werewolf boss, Ben, who makes an appearance in book one and book two. And um, this uh, vampire succubus assassin that he um, accidentally buys on eBay. <laughs> but the hero, it's actually, this is something I did. Um, I bought a vampire succubus assassin on eBay because I thought it was hilarious. It's like this crystal rock. It's like 99 cents piece of plastic that they swore was possessed by this very sexy succubus named Eleonora. So I bought it for 99 cents and then made her the heroine of book three. So they're sort of bound together by this spell, um, sort of Ella Enchanted-esque, where she has to obey his every command, but he's he's a very nice man and he he does not realize this and also does not want to give her commands at all. So they sort of have to figure out how to undo the curse. Um, and there's like local small town politics and a mayoral election and, and some experimental theater uh, and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's a lot. I, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> in there. It covers, it's all things to all people. It covers so many races. Experimental theaters. Uh-huh. Yeah, she, she uh, the succubus uh, starts an experimental theater career. It's, it's great. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I don't, I can't really follow up on that. <laughs> um, well, oh my God, it was so amazing to talk to you today thank you so much for making time for us obviously it's it's fairly early out there so um yes no. caffeine and cats combined yes no this has been great i'm sorry my cats are racing around like maniacs um <laughs> I'll, I'll pick one up right now there's one right here this is coco hey coco hello <laughs> um so they're they're finally calming down now that the interview is over of course, yeah, of course. Is, but they're um but you know what? This is this has been just lovely. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, not a problem at all. And if you're obviously ever over in the UK, we would love to. I would love to. Um, I don't think I told anyone. I don't know if anyone knows this, but um, I went to grad school at the University of Sheffield, so I I lived in the UK for two years. Uh, so I do come, I do come back and visit sometimes. Oh so. my god! Well, yes, because yeah. so our offices are very near Hachette's offices. So if you oh. we're over the bridge. So, that would be lovely <laughs> say hello um but yeah for for everyone out there watching copies of this available to buy now we've got some lovely displays in all of our stores as well so everyone's obsessed so go to forbiddenplant.com or go to your local store and pick it up but yeah thank you so much for joining us today thank you i hope you have a great day you too bye bye if you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.